Hi, today I'm going to introduce you to security. Um, security and inf information security is an actual major that you can take at Pittsburgh Technical College and many other schools. Um, what I'm going to do today is just give a really quick introduction to some of the basic tenets of the security and take a look at a couple things you can do today to increase the security of your device. So, my objectives then. I want to describe some of the challenges of securing information. I want to define information security, and I'll listen to describe some of the five principles of defense. Let's start with some recent attacks in 2021. 2021 has so far been the year of ransomware. Uh, you've probably heard about the Colonial Pipeline. Shut down the pipeline for a week, uh, gas shortage throughout the southeast of the country, and gas prices around the eastern seaboard skyrocketed. Uh, local television station PXI TV was one of a couple stations that were hit with the ransomware. They were unable to broadcast news one night. And then Nebraska Medicine was unable to render services for a few days because of ransomware. In most cases, the ransomware is paid and the hacker releases the data. Um, some data leaks this year. LinkedIn had 500 million user profiles linked out. Um, Facebook has had 533 million user personal data linked out. And the Cancer Treatment Centers of America had 105,000 patients' data leaked. It's only the middle of the year. Um, there have been over 100 attacks already of notes. Now, why is this the case? Because this stuff is not easy. Um, these things get harder every year to protect. They get more and more complicated. The hackers get better. The anti-security teams get better. Um, security challenges change every day. Security is not a job you take and say, well, I'm done. I'm here. Security is a job says, well, I just started and I'm going to learn everything again. So it's a very difficult procedure. Um, one of the reasons is the concept of security versus convenience. Now, let me define this for a minute. Security if you, the more secure your machine is, the harder it is to work with. Um, convenience is the ease of working with an asset. Really good example here is, are seat belts. Seat belts make you more comfortable or more secure, but they're a pain to butt to put on. Like if you're heavy set, they're very uncomfortable, like for me. Um, so the automotive industry has made them easier and easier and easier to work with every year, but you still have people not using them. Security tends to be inversely propor proportional to convenience, which means that the more secure something is, the harder it can be to work with. Here's a nice slide about this. The more convenient something is to work with, the less secure it is. Let me set up an example. Here's one. Door must remain closed. That door's clearly propped open. This is a situation where somebody needed to come in and out of that door even though it has to remain closed. This is a security breach. And you've seen this in restaurants and stores around the world. Um, let's take a look at another example. I'm going to pull up Windows settings here. Then look up Controlled Folder Access. This is a great tool. This tool can help you, if you turn it on, protect your machine against ransomware. Was what it does is it only allows certain files to write to your machine. It's great. So I turn this on and I can't get ransomware. Wonderful. But every time I do something on this box, it blocks it. So then I have to come in here to block history and take a look at here and turn stuff on. I can look right here at something I did today. You see, I tried to write something from ZenMap out to my machine. Now, I've been using ZenMap for years, and it wouldn't let me write it out. I had to go back here and allow an app, and allow that particular app through. So that is an example of lack of convenience. My machine is more secure, but every time I save something for a new app, i got to say, yep, this is allowed. All right, so information security. Um, this is a great job, but you are never rarely ahead of the game. This is a job for most people, 9 to 5, or whatever your hours are. The hackers and the people that want to break into your job, they work 24-7. So you're just doing your best here to keep up most of the time. Typically, the hackers know something that you don't, and if you want to protect your machine, you're just going to do the best that you can. Quite often, there's somebody better than you. I've 
got to really get a good story about this. Uh, this idea of it's the best ever type of job. It's a true story. Uh, many years ago, there's a liquor store in the west end of Pittsburgh. And my father's friend would break into that liquor store every Saturday night and steal a bottle of Crown Royal. Well, manager got tired of people breaking into a store and stealing a bottle of Crown Royal, so the manager put up a big gate across the windows and the door. You know, you've seen the big, you know, pull down from the top gates, you can't break in. He thought he protected his store. Well, my dad's friend was not only a thief, he was also a masonry worker. He knew how to work with concrete. So what the gentleman did over the period of several weekends over the summer is he went behind the liquor store and cut the, or chiseled the, the mortar out from around the concrete blocks. On Labor Day weekend, he rented a U-Haul truck, he drove to the back of the, that liquor store, went in through the hole he made in the wall, and then proceeded to steal every bottle of liquor in the liquor store. He then put it in the U-Haul truck, patched his hole back up, and then drove around the west end of Pittsburgh delivering bottles to people. It was like Robin Hood. Now, this gentleman did get caught for that, and he went to jail. But can you imagine going to back to work Tuesday morning to the liquor store, um, rolling up the gate and walking in and seeing every bottle of liquor in the store gone? That's exactly the type of people you're up against. They will do anything to break in. If they want in, they're eventually going to get in. And all you can do is say, I did my best. And as long as you can validate that you did your best, you're going to be okay. All right, some goals of information security. So if you're into this, you basically want to make sure that the people can see the data or are supposed to see the data. Think about your medical information. You and your doctor can see that. I can't see that. You want to make sure the data is correct and unchanged. Again, imagine your medical information. If you get a bad diagnosis, you don't want me to go in and change it. And then availability. When you need to know your data, it has to be there. Those are your primary goals. CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, to do that, there are three basic tenets of security. These are called the AAA. You want to secure stuff, you'd have to deal with authentication, users who they claim to be. Authorization provides approval to users over resources. And accounting, keeping track of events. Well, authentication is easy. Username and password. You can't log in your machine if you use username and password. Um, if you take a step up, step up and go to two-factor authentication, you need username and password and a PIN that's somehow sent to you over your phone, whether it's via SMS, which isn't very secure, or using some third-party app like Google um, Authenticate or Blizzard's Authenticate. Authorization is providing approval to users over resources. Take a look at my video folder here. If I want to add people to this, if I go to its properties, I go to security, you can see that I've got people here that can access this. If I want to edit that, and let's want to add somebody. Let's see if I have somebody in this box to add. No, I, mean, well, I could add a user here. I don't seem to have any users, but I could add a user here. Or I could say, you know what, Lee Control can't write to his own folder. I have access to who can access my individual folders. That is authorization. And accounting is just turning on Big Brother and creating a list of who can access this. A um, good example of Big Brother is if you ever go into a situation like where the company has a set of keys, but they're secured. And every time you take a key, somebody writes down the name, date, and time of who took the key. Then if something goes missing from the room that the key opened up, they know who was in there and they knew who to track. That's accounting. Uh, we tend to do this in a digital way, and every time you access a folder, a Big Brother file is updated with who did it, when they did it, and what they changed. All right, so those are the basic tenets. When you learn about security, you'll spend a lot of time in these. In the programming world, we'll spend a lot of time on each one of these. I'll set up an accounting database in our database class. Authorization, we'll learn how to set up um, permissions on websites, and we'll learn how to set up usernames and passwords across websites. You will do this. Now, when you go to security, people always think about the concept of being hacked. Well, there's a little bit of difference here. Vulnerability is a weakness in a system. There are lots of vulnerabilities in a system. Think about your house. I've got, we've got windows and doors and chimneys and garage doors. It's a weakness to get in your house. The threat is a potential attack to do so. 
So a good example of this is the, the world is vulnerable to being hit by an asteroid. They're vulnerable. You know, as NASA says, it's not if we get hit by an asteroid or a meteor. It's about when. That's the vulnerability. The threat is a potential attack. The list of threats and vulnerabilities is endless. Uh, a friend of a friend knew the head security person at Cisco Computer Systems. The man ended up quitting um, because he had ulcers the size of softballs because he could not stop thinking about all the threats and vulnerabilities to his system. So essentially what you're talking about here is risk. So if you're setting up a system and you're the person that's to manage the security of the system, you have to deal with risk. And these are your five choices with risk. Notice you cannot eliminate risk. Life is risk. If you don't believe me, watch the Final Destination movies. So let's take an example in real life. Let's talk about sports. The risk is head injury from sports. You see it all the time. You know, football players getting concussions, soccer players getting concussions, young kids getting concussions. So that's the risk. How do you avoid it? Don't play. Accept it? Play anyway. Hundreds of thousands of kids every year play soccer, football, baseball, etc. And many of them get hit in the head. Um, how do you mitigate it? Wear a helmet. So if you watch softball games, all the infielders now wear face masks. All the batters have helmets. You're on the base path. You wear a helmet. The idea is to mitigate getting hit in the head with a ball. Deterrence? You write rules to avoid head-to-head -head contact. The NFL did this. They avoided you know, spearing and leading with the helmets. A number of attempts to reduce head injuries. Then transfer it, have someone else play for you. That's it. Or buy insurance against head injuries. You've heard of celebrities insuring their legs or their arms or their voice or something. They understand risk is going to be there. The transference is transferring over insurance, so if they happen to lose access to whatever they insured, they at least get a payday after it. Now, to your computer and your network, there are thousands of risks. Thousands. I'm going to look at a couple. Right? One of those is spoofing. Spoofing is pretending to be a different computer. This allows me to enable other attacks. So if I pretend to be your server and you try to log in, I've now got your username and password. And I can do that either by pretending to be a different IP or a different MAC address. Now you may think that's hard. It's not. There are tools like Ettercap that do this for you. But you can also look something up. So I'm going to look up how to spoof MAC address and there's videos, there's things, you know, it's not a hard thing to do. Don't need that yet. Another one is denial of service. Denial of service is a really simple thing to pull off. In the networking world, if I ask you a properly formatted question, you have to answer it. Great example. Come up to somebody who's wearing a watch, say, hey, what time is it? That person will just stop what they're doing and look at their watch and tell me what time it is. You want to deny a service that person? Have 50 people in the lobby, everybody go up and ask them what time it is. That person will stop and look at his watch, stop and look at his watch, stop and look at his watch. That's denial of service. I saw this in action once. My daughter, when she was about 13, she was built like a 50s pinup model. And we were at Kennywood. And we're standing in line for the jackrabbit. And this kid, uh, a year or two older than her, comes up to her and says, Excuse me, you know what time it is? My daughter, you know, dutifully pulled out her phone and said, It's 312. And the guy said, Thanks, you want to go ride with me? What a great use of a common protocol. You know, he used that, what time is it to gain entrance to the system, and then he tried to exploit the system by asking my daughter to ride. Um, think about the um, guts it took to ask someone to ride right next to her dad. But that's denial of service, and it's not hard to pull off. You've probably heard of DDoS, distributed denial of service. That's when you have a whole bunch of people asking the same question at the same time. You ask enough questions, the system gets overwhelmed, and it shuts down. Next one is social engineering. In social engineering, you're pretending to be somebody important or somebody you're not. There's a great movie called Catch Me If You Can, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and um, Tom Hanks. Leonardo DiCaprio um, plays a con man, essentially. And the movie follows his exploits to pretend to be an English teacher, an airline pilot, a doctor, etc. And you can watch him social engineer the people. 
the one of my favorite scenes is when he's in this high school classroom. He's 17 years old. He walks in with a jacket and a tie. People think he's a substitute teacher, so he acts like one. Tells him to read the book, ridicules the football player. It's hysterical. Now, you'll see this in modern movies as well. This is a scene from Avengers Endgame. And this is when they're all back in time trying to get the stones. Okay, you probably remember the scene, but I'll point something out here as I play this. Guy in green is locally. Pay attention to the dude here and the security guards. Okay, that's Tony Stark, right? Rewind this a little bit. That's Tony Stark too. The guy in black right here. So, you remember, if you saw the movie, they played these time games and went back in time. But Tony Stark here is dressed like a security guard. And nobody questions him. If you want to play social engineering games, one of the first things you do is just look the part. I've often said, if I wanted to hack a company, I would get a Comcast polo, rent a white van, buy a Comcast sticker, put it on the side, and drive up and say, hey, your network's down, I need to check something out. And most people would believe me. All you have to do is act the part and sound the part and people will buy it. Um, if you want to see more of this, Google on YouTube uh, social engineering examples and there's dozens of really well done examples of how social engineering works. It's a scary hack. And it hacks the weakest part of your link, which is your people in your company. Okay, so how to protect against this. Here's your, your five goals to protect. Um, layering, limiting, diversity, obscurity, and simplicity. I'm going to define each one of these in a minute. Um, basically, you don't limit yourself to one security tool. You hide the best you can, and you keep it as simple as possible. That's your defensive strategy. So let's go, off, go through these. Remember Shrek? Shrek's are like, uh, or ogres are like onions, they got layers. Network security is the same thing. You have more than one thing defending your network. Your home machine right now, your home network right now, has a router between it and the world. That's a thing from your ISP. That router has a public IP address that doesn't let anything past it that's not specifically requested from internally. On that router is a low-level firewall that protects from outside breaching. Internally, inside your organization, you have Windows, whatever, or Mac, whatever, and it's got a firewall built in on it, and it has tools built in to protect you against bad web searches. Just on a basic default installation at home, you have like four or five things between the bad guys and the web and you. So layering, you want to have more than one security technique in place. You also should, you know, not have the same copy. I'll get that in a second. Limiting is reduce access to the information. So you have usernames and passwords set on your box and have restrictions set on what they can look at. Uh, for the networking world, this is really easy. This is just going through, you know, permissions on a server. In the programming world, we'll write rules and say everybody that has write access can write to the database. People that only have read access can only read the database. By restricting who can edit the information, you do a better job of protecting it. Think about your bank account. You don't want other people deleting from your bank accounts. The only person you can delete from the bank account is people that you've given access to. Your spouse maybe your kid, uh, perhaps you have an automatic payment set up to Comcast. Those are limiting to who can pull out of your bank account. Everybody else, the bank says, nope, try again. Diversity is using multiple products. Most home users will buy one product. Like for instance, I use Microsoft's very good Defender product. It's built into Windows 10. That's a bad example of diversity. To make it better, you should use, say, Windows 10 antivirus, but Semantics Firewall and Cisco's uh, data protection services. The idea is to have multiple products from multiple vendors. It does make it harder, but if I use one tool and somebody bypasses that one tool, I'm host. If I have five tools between the bad guys in my data, the bad guy has to break through five devices. A uh, physical example, this is my grandmother when I was a kid. My grandmother lived in East Liberty, and she believed that everybody was out to get her. So every night when we'd go to bed, she would lock the screen door, which in of itself is funny. She would then lock the door, and then she would put a shovel up underneath the door. 
you know, up under the handle. So someone trying to break in her door had to break through the screen door, which is a joke. Then they had to break through the pretty serious locks that she had in that, front, that door. And then they had to somehow manage to break past the physics of that shovel holding the door closed. That's diversity. Obscurity is hiding the details. I always chuck when I walk past somebody's car and says, protected by Viper or protected by Ford Motor Security. As soon as I see that sign when it's protected by, I can Google how to defeat Viper car alarm or Ford auto security. And I'm sure there's a website that will tell me. So don't tell people what you're using to protect your boxes. When you set up things like network servers, there's a tool called a banner which you can ask information about that device. Turn it off. And I'll show you why in a second here of that. Um, last one is simplicity. The harder something is to deal with, the less people will deal with it. Go back to that convenience versus security. When I first switched to Microsoft Defender, it was back when they had a different name. I forget it right now. Um, but I switched to it because I had been using some of the free antivirus tools. And they worked. Things like AVG and Avast, but they were complicated. And it would pop up and put a really complicated question in front of the users. And at the time, I had... Um, you know, young children in the house, and they don't read error messages. So a thing will pop up, something about a virus, and it would ask, do you want to ignore it, block it, or delete it? And they would always pick ignore, which, of course, completely defeats the purpose of having a security system. Windows Defender, which is what it's called now, took the question out of the person's hand, and it just did the most secure thing possible. So if it thought it was a virus, it blocked it. If it thought it was a bad thing, it blocked it. And it didn't tell anybody. For um, network security people, that's a little scary because they'd like to know what's happening. But when you have a three-year-old using your computer, they're not going to read the box. They're going to click OK. <laughs> and Defender took that choice out of their hands. All right, last thing you can do to defend yourself, and this goes outside of the five, is you can try to break into yourself. This is called a penetration test. These are not easy. This is basically legal hacking. Um, as long as somebody has given you the permission to try to break into the system, it's called a penetration test. If you break into somebody's system and then tell them after the fact that you're penetration testing, that's illegal. So a penetration test is someone asking you to check to see how secure they are. And basically, the goal is to find and exploit problems in networks. There can be many of them. The first step is footprinting and see what is visible in the network. I use a tool called um, ZenMap here. To pull this off. And here's my Zen map tool. And this is my Wi Fi. This is the device that's on my Wi Fi right now. I'm trying to not get that to pop up. 192.168.55.34, that's my phone. You go down to the bottom, Pixel 5, that's my wife's phone. When I look at what pops up here, I see some information. The first one is my Luma. That's what I use to get Wi-Fi throughout the house. And we see I have a Luma box there at 192.168.55.1. You see what services are up and running on it. A hacker can look at this and see, oh, port 80, which is your basic HTTP port, is open on that Luma device. And then it would come in a port 80, ask a basic HTTP question, and then use that to start taking over the device. And then as I scroll down here, you can see more about it. And uh, eventually get down to this guy. Here's my printer. I know that by two reasons. One, because I set up the device and I know it's 167. But secondly, I see Jet Direct there and I know that's a printer. And you can also see that it's an Epson type of printer. This scan took less than 30 seconds. And I got all this information. And I did, as you can see up here, a regular scan. Um, I have the ability to do really complicated scans, like this intense scan. And this will totally, completely identify every device in my network. It takes like half an hour to run, but it will tell me everything. Even this basic scan, look at this, here's my TV. <laughs> 44 is my TV. Now from this, I can use another tool, which I'm not gonna pull up called Nessus, N-E-S-S-U-S. -S. Nessus will take this output and then search a known database of exploits and lets you test these exploits in a nice secure environment. You could then take this information and run over to another program called Metasploit. Again, I won't pull that up. Uh, Metasploit will not only find some data, but it will also allow you to launch attacks. 
not hard to pull this off initially. So with that Wireshark and Nessus or Metasploit, I can discover vulnerabilities. Metasploit will allow me to exploit the vulnerabilities, and then if it's a pen test, I write a report. But you would use this tool to help find problems in your network. Uh, PTC has several people that have graduated from the security program that do pen testing for a living, and they love it. But it's not easy. You basically have to know nearly everything about networking, and a lot about programming, and a lot about security to pull this off. But it's a cool job, it really is. We're not gonna do this with programming. You know, most I'll do is I'll have you implement the AAA. I'll let you play with this if you want. Every tool I talked about here is totally free and legit. Um, if you want to get a copy of ZenMap, go to insecure.org. Yeah, I know. Um, it looks like a website developed by a program, and it is, but it is secure. Um, Nessus is a little more difficult to set up, um, but if you're smart, you can read the screen. All right, so this is um, the end of our security discussion. I could spend literally months talking about this. I just wanted to get the basics out to you guys. Um, the idea of the AAA, you know, confident, you know, get the CIA discussion, a brief discussion of some of the exploits that are available. And I wanted to show you just some of the basic attacks that have happened this year. Your assignments for this week include a really cool tool where you're working with um, what's called steganography. You're going to learn how to hide a message inside of a picture. It's pretty neat. It's another type of attack. All right. Thank you for listening. Have a good night.